So I'm going to begin by priming some ideas that I want you to think about as I move through this argument about this concept of institutional corruption. Three ideas. The first is this notion of influence. So we all have a sense of influence. Here's Oxford's sense, a thing or person that exercises action or power. Think of the influence on something like this pathetic red dot representing any of us. The influence on this pathetic red dot can be different. So law could have an influence. But in addition to law having an influence, we can think about norms having an influence, the market having an influence, even architecture having an influence on this pathetic red dot. The point is the influences here are diverse. And depending upon the particular policy objective we have, they can be complementing or conflicting. And I suggest when we think about influences here, we need to therefore think about this economy of influence, an economy of influence that works together and needs to be understood if we're to see how to move the pathetic red dot in the direction we want to move it. That's what I mean by influence. It's the first idea. Here's the second. <clears throat> the concept of independence. Now, by independence, I don't mean to refer to what the Americans were obsessing about circa 1776. I don't mean separating ourselves from Britain. I mean to think about independence in a way that was also at the center of their thinking. Independence in the sense of someone who is not dependent upon someone. Dependence here, or what they spoke a lot about, a lot about so did Jane Austen, dependency. Right? So dependency in the sense of the relation of a thing or a person to that by which it is supported, state of subjection or subordination. This too was a central obsession of our framers. As Jefferson described it in his notes on Virginia, dependency here begets subservience and venality, suffocates the germ of virtue, and prepares fit tools for the designs of ambition. And so what they sought was non-dependent representatives, independent representatives who would find the right answer for the right reason. Their common aim was a set of institutions, you could say, constitutions against dependence. Now, obviously, however, right, independence does not mean independence from everything. Independence means, in a certain sense, the proper dependence. So to say independent legislators means legislators who are dependent upon the people. To say an independent judiciary means judges dependent upon the law. The key in identifying what the relevant sense of independence is, is define the proper dependence and to limit the improper dependence, where proper is a function of the institution, person, or thing. That's independence. And finally, <clears throat> concept of responsibility. 2006, I had the privilege of representing plaintiff in a case, Hard Work versus the American Boy Choir School. This was a case focused on an extraordinary series of uh, uh, events, child abuse at this institution. Abuse perpetrated by a single person who lived in this place in that building. And the question that was raised in the suit was, who was responsible for this abuse? Was it the pathological person, the person who lived here? Or was it also the people who could have just picked up a phone and called someone to report what was obvious to all of them going on in that institution? Well, the trial court in this case concluded that all wrongs under New Jersey law, even criminal wrongs, <clears throat> were wrongs that the institution meaning the entity represented uh, by these people who could have picked up the phone was immune for, could have no responsibility for those. The focus of the law, the exclusive focus of the law was on this one pathological individual. So what that means is that one person 
who it's least likely for us to be able to reform was responsible, and the one entity that could have done something about it, namely the collection of people in the building who understood what was going on and could have just picked up a phone, was immune. Now, this way of thinking about responsibility is not uncommon. Uh, Al Gore, hero of mine, writes in a way about a similar kind of responsibility. Indeed, he's guilty of the same kind of narrow conception of responsibility. In his book, An Assault on Reason, he spends an extraordinary amount of time focusing his criticism on this man. Never once does he draw our attention to the institution surrounding that man who could have checked every single abuse that he perpetrated. His focus was on the one who in some sense couldn't be reformed and immunized the one that could do something about it. Now this conception of responsibility I want to reject. In a sense I want to have the opposite of it. I want, of course, that we think about the one that we can't reform as responsible, pathetic perhaps, but responsible. But the one that could do something about it, indeed, often in these cases, could do something about it simply, we should also consider critically to be responsible. We should think about that responsibility, indeed, first. That's the sense of responsibility. Okay, so here's an argument. I want to talk about institutional corruption. Let me help you understand what I mean by that. First by telling you what I don't think institutional corruption is. Institutional corruption in the sense I want to talk about it is not something like this creature, Blagojevich. <laughs> Blagojevich is not an instance of institutional corruption because what I'm talking about is not cases of bribery or violating the law or what Blagojevich called just politics here. I'm not talking about any violation of existing rules. That's not the subject that's of my interest. What it is, in the sense that I want to talk about it, is a certain kind of influence. Influence within, as I described it, an economy of influence, influence that has a certain effect. It's either influence that weakens the effectiveness of an institution or influence that weakens the public trust of an institution. That's what I mean by institutional corruption. So let's start with an example that most of us will think of as an easy case. This institution. If you've read this extraordinary book by Robert Kaiser, So Damn Much Money, you'll recognize that the story of this institution has changed dramatically in just the past 15 years. And the engine of that change is the extraordinary growth of an industry around lobbying, an industry we should think of as a certain kind of economy. Here are the components. Lobbyists, benefiting members, who benefit interests, who benefit the lobbyists. In the sense of an economy, each pays the other, and each depends upon the other. So lobbyists paying members, both during and after their tenure as members of Congress. During their tenure, lobbyists pay with cash, and I don't mean the Blagojevich sense of cash. I mean instead support for campaigns, also a Blagojevich sense of cash, of course, but support for campaigns as the cost of campaigns has exploded. Members have become increasingly dependent upon campaign cash. Estimates range between 30 and 70 percent of a member's time is spent raising money either for themselves or their party to get back into power. And lobbyists increasingly have become suppliers of this cash, not themselves directly, that's a small part of any campaign contribution, but indirectly by assuring or facilitating campaign contributions from the interests they represent. They're suppliers or pushers in this industry of funding. Now the point is to recognize how this is new, as Kaiser describes it. Money has been part of American politics forever, on occasion in the Gilded Age or the Harding administration, for example, much more blatantly than recently. 
but the scale of it has just gotten way out of hand. The money may have come in brown paper bags in earlier eras, but the politicians needed and took much less of it than they take through more formal channels today. They need and they take much more, and they're in this sense then dependent upon those who supply. That's during their tenure. Increasingly also after their tenure, they're paid by the lobbyists. The lobbyists pay with a certain promise of future employment. As my friend Congressman Jim Cooper describes it, Washington has increasingly become a kind of farm league for K Street. Members and staffers and bureaucrats increasingly have a common business model in their head as they serve in Washington. The business model is focused on their life after government, life as lobbyists. 50% of senators between 1998 and 2004, as Public Citizen reported, translated their Senate tenure into a career as lobbyists. 42% of members of the House. Increasingly, the point is people, everyone inside the system, depends upon this system surviving. And it's that dependency that puts the lobbyist in a strong position to, in this sense, pay the members, both during and after their time in Congress. Then the members pay the interest. This is obvious to everyone now. Explosion of this going on in the healthcare debate. Brazenly, in other areas of congressional attention, think about the recent cap and trade bill. Maplight, which is an organization tracking money and politics, uh, and on whose board I sit, uh, de uh, uh, delivered this report about a month and a half ago about the vote on the cap and trade bill. In a section describing the amendment to gut the bill, they tracked the contributions of people voting to gut the bill versus those who didn't, found that on average that those voting to gut received three times the money from the interests of those opposing, or redefining biomass in a way that would fundamentally undermine environmental protections. The ratio was 10 times the contribution received by those who supported that change to those who didn't. In this sense, the policies get bent to those who pay for these policies. And sometimes, as researchers have demonstrated, to an extraordinary return. So this University of Kansas paper describing the rate of return for this statute, the American Jobs Creation Act, discovered that the rate of return on lobbyist expenditures was 22,000%. In a world where returns like this are available through lobbying, one can well understand why resources get devoted to lobbying rather than to innovating to find the next great mousetrap. That's a sense in which members pay interest. And then the interest pay the lobbyists. Again, Kaiser. In earlier generations, enterprising young men came to Washington looking for power and political adventure, often with ambitions to save or reform the country or the world. In the last fourth of the 20th century, such aspirations were supplanted by another familiar American yearning to get rich. So the industry which he has described here is now a nine to $12 billion industry. One man, Gerald Cassidy, who is credited with envisioning how earmarks could actually be translated into a tool of policy cash, has earned more than $100 million inside of this particular industry. This is the way these entities function together in this economy. Now the claim is this economy has an effect, or at least let's say plausibly this economy has an effect, an effect related to my conception of institutional corruption. First, it plausibly weakens the effectiveness of the institution. Second, it plausibly weakens public trust of the institution. Let's start with effectiveness. First, it plainly shifts priorities. So in what I think is one of the very best papers studying the effect of lobbyists by Hall and Deerdorf, Hall and Deerdorf develop a very sophisticated model of lobbyists as really subsidies to the legislature in the sense that lobbyists don't primarily focus their attention on trying to get somebody to flip his or her vote, but instead they subsidize the work of the legislature provide, by providing the legislator with additional resources to advance his or her interests which on one level sounds benign, 
But when one thinks about the mix of interests that do get funding by lobbyists versus interests that don't, it obviously skews the work of the legislators. So if you, as a congressperson, go to Washington and you have two concerns, number one is to stop piracy of CDs, and number two is to help working moms on welfare, you obviously, when you open your door on your first day in Washington, will get a line of lobbyists who are there to help you with your first concern, and no lobbyists there to help you with the second concern. So the budget constraint of your work shifts as a function of the work of these lobbyists, therefore shifting the work of Congress. Secondly, people argue it bends the policies, i.e. the results of what Congress does. Now, the politicians, of course, <clears throat> claim this is ridiculous. They're willing to admit it affects access to members. So here's Congressman Mazzoli. People who contribute get the ear of the member and the ear of the staff. They have access, and access is it. Access is power. But they insist it doesn't change results. Now, Acting as a kind of Davidsonian here, I find this uh, pretty hard to believe if we want to be charitable about the behavior of members of Congress. Because we can look at a series of easy cases and understand them not easily if, in fact, it's not money affecting the results. The kind of 2 plus 2 equals 4 of government, which the government gets consistently wrong. So, for example, an area which was my focus for about a decade, copyright. My focus on activism and copyright began on October 27, 1998, when Congress, in honor of this man, Sonny Bono, enacted the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, a statute which extended the term of existing copyrights and future copyrights by 20 years. Now, the question Congress should have been wrestling with as they thought about the idea of extending the term of an existing copyright is could the extension of the term of an existing copyright serve the public policy objectives of copyright, which is to create incentives to produce something new? And if logic were in the collection of tools that anybody considering that were deploying, one would conclude that no, you couldn't create incentives to create something new by extending the incentives or something that's already been created. So does it advance the public good? The answer should have been no. Indeed, when we challenged this statute in the Supreme Court and had a brief signed by 20 uh, economists, including five Nobel Prize winners, one liberal Nobel Prize winner, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's Milton Friedman, right-wing Nobel Prize winner, said he would sign the brief opposing this extension only if the word no-brainer was in the brief <laughs> someplace. But apparently there were no brains in this place when the statute was passed. So easy public policy question, Congress gets wrong. Or think about in the context of nutrition. There's a consensus among those who know something about the matter that we eat way too much of this stuff not enough of this stuff. 2003, World Health Organization decided they would try to act on this consensus by promulgating a standard that said only 10% of your daily caloric intake should come from added sugar. Well, the sugar industry, represented by this cute little logo, went ballistic. There they are, ballistic. <laughs> They got the United States Senate to threaten to withdraw funding from the WHO if they didn't back down from their absurd request that we only have 10% of our daily caloric intake from added sugar. They wanted Congress to adopt, they wanted the uh, WHO to adopt the standard that 25% of our daily caloric intake could come from added sugar. Well, the WHO didn't back down, but our government did. In 2003, the Food Nutrition Board promulgated standards saying 25% of your daily caloric intake could come from added sugar once the vote on the committee that decides this had changed because one more industry representative had become a member of the committee. So that now a balanced diet, according to our government, looks something like this. You can start breakfast with Fruit Loops or M&M, <laughs> glass of milk, cheeseburger for lunch, Pepperoni pizza for dinner, and the three slices of pepperoni pizza for dinner, and of course, sugar cookies for dessert. That's a balanced diet, according to our government. Once again, easy public policy question, government gets wrong. Or maybe most profoundly, think about the context of global warming. As everybody now recognizes, there's a consensus that we're doing it, as Gore <laughs> puts it. The debate is over. There are five points in the consensus. Number one, global warming is real. Number two, we human beings are mainly responsible. Number three, consequences are very bad. Number four, we need to fix it quickly. 
And number five, it's not too late. People wanted to evaluate the strength of this consensus, so they looked at 1,000 peer-reviewed journals published between 1993 and 2003. And they found that exactly 0%, zero, of those articles questioned that consensus. Then they did a random collection of 600 popular media articles between 1988 and 2002. They discovered that 53% of those articles questioned the basic consensus. And the reason for this difference, of course, is the product of the junk science, which created the opportunity for policymakers to continue the delay Indeed, I optimistically thought it would only be 10 years. It's not clear will I get anything addressing this problem even this year. Once again, an easy public policy question which the Congress gets wrong. Now, my point is they are either getting these easy questions wrong because they're idiots or because they're guided by something other than reason. And my view is that they are not idiots that what explains this behavior is not misunderstanding. What explains this behavior is the significant effects of these influences. And obviously, it's not just in the easy cases. In cases where the issues are extremely hard, here too, indeed especially here, this money has an influence, fundamentally affecting uh, the decisions in these cases because of this economy, an economy I think we can rightly call a kind of corruption. Now, I build this idea, extend this idea, from the work of Dennis in this book, uh, Ethics on Corruption and other areas. He's described this idea of institutional corruption. As he defines it in this book, uh, legislative corruption is institutional insofar as the gain a member receives is political rather than personal. The service the member provides is procedurally improper, and the connection between the gain and the service has a tendency to damage the legislature or the democratic process. I would modify this only by saying I don't think we need to insist upon the requirement of procedural impropriety. I think it's enough to find the process produces this harm to identify it as a kind of corruption. If it weakens the effectiveness of the institution in reflecting democratic views or weakens public trust in the institution, which plausibly leads fewer to participate in electing the institution itself. So that's the first idea. Does it change the results? Second, public trust. In the district I came from in California, more than 88% of people believe money buys results in Congress. Why do they believe that? Well, one reason they believe that is the kind of brazenness of a man like this. Here's Max Baucus, a man who represents 0.3% of the American public population, but controls in a substantial way what the future of health care reform will look like. He has openly solicited an extraordinary amount of money from healthcare industries. Indeed, $4 million contributed to him because he sits on top of a committee that will decide what the future of healthcare looks like. Now, this behavior, too, is importantly new. Again, as Kaiser reports about this man, Mississippi Senator John Stennis, a man we wouldn't think of as a person who lived his life to the highest ethical standards. Nonetheless, when he was asked by a younger member of Congress to hold a fundraiser when he was the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. Stennis paused and said to him, uh, wait, would that be proper? I hold life and death over those companies. I don't think it would be proper for me to take money from them. This ethical idea is invisible in Washington today. The opposite is embraced by both parties and the leaders in the most important committees of both parties. So that brazenness, number one, leads people to believe money buys and results. And then the second thing is kind of puzzles in particular votes that members might advance. So here's Mike Ross. He's a Arkansas congressperson. He lives in a district where two to one people supported the public option in the health care uh, bill. He took a leadership role in stopping the public option, indeed bragged about the fact he had stopped the public option after receiving about a million dollars, actually $921,000 from healthcare industry. Now, this pattern, acting against the interests of your constituents, well, in favor of the interests of your funders, doesn't necessarily imply that you've been bought by your funders, but it does have the effect of leading people to believe that it's money that buys results here. If you take an unpopular position without taking money from special interests, that's a profile in courage. If you take 
money from special interests and then act against the interests of your constituents, that's behavior that leads to precisely the cynicism that defines the way people think of Congress, leading latest poll, 22% to have a favorable impression of Congress. Plausibly, more people supported the British crown at the time of the revolution than support our Congress today. So the point is, if these claims I've made are true, and I think at least you have to concede they're plausible, this would be an example of what I'm calling institutional corruption. And I'm going to use it as a paradigm, and then ask the question in other contexts. Because when you see it as a paradigm, a set of influences that either weaken effectiveness or weaken trust in an institution, we can see it in lots of places in public life. Plenty of these are alleged. And the question is, how would we prove them? How would we know? So in the context of medicine, for example, drug companies have been at the center of allegations about this problem. Prescription drug companies, um, prescription drugs uh, are, of course, a huge part of the American economy. In 2005, $200 billion were spent on prescription drugs. That's five times the amount that was spent in 1990. In 2000, about $15 billion was spent on promoting these prescription drugs, about $5 billion of that in a process called detailing. Detailing means when someone goes around to doctors or to hospitals and tries to push on them the idea of one drug better than another, a kind of personal uh, promotion and marketing. Um, now, between 1995 and 2005, the number of detailers increased from about 38,000 to 100,000, meaning by 2005, there were two and a half doctors in America for every detailer. And of course, their practice, until significantly affected by recent legislation, was to give out samples and gifts. And this is how they understood the purpose of their practice. Here's one detailer describing it. The essence of pharmaceutical gifting is bribes that aren't considered bribes. While it's the doctor's job, as this detailer described it, to treat patients and not to justify their actions, it's my job to constantly sway the doctors. It's a job I'm paid and trained to do. Doctors are neither trained nor paid to negotiate. Most of the time, they don't even realize that's what they're doing. Now, from my perspective, this is really small potatoes there, compared to the more fundamental point here about basic research, basic research and basic science. So for example, Professor Drummond Rennie at University of California, San Francisco has become a vocal critic of the way money is involved in this process too. So in this paper, when evidence is it, uh, he described his process of coming to see this problem. He said, I became a medical editor just at the time when instances of scientific fraud were hitting the newspapers. These were cases of fabricated work, cases where the bad guys were out there making up the data and the good guys, as he put it, got it. But as they then described, after a year or so as an editor, it became obvious to me that such rare cases, the chainsaw massacres of science, were not the main problem. We are now discovering a vastly more important problem, the massive bias and distortion of the public e published evidence by researchers and their sponsors, both influenced by money. As Rennie puts it, when scientists had a great deal at stake, some were prepared in the name of prestige to take shortcuts falsify, fabricate, plagiarize, bamboozle, lie, cheat, and throw away their reputation simply to notch up more publications, advance their career, and of course, make more money. The result, Rennie says, was, as he described it, false science. In every one of the major scores of studies which published trials, of published trials, an overwhelming bias was found in favor of sponsors' drugs, a bias that was not present when the trials were performed by investigators free of commercial funding, that he calls a kind of corruption. Now, Rennie is making a complex set of claims. And I think we have to frame this as a genuine question about whether these claims are true. Do the practices that he's pointing to either weaken the effectiveness of medicine, meaning change the results that doctors otherwise would be acting upon, or do they weaken the public trust for medicine? And what would it take from a scientific perspective to know whether these two possible negative outcomes were true. Or think about the context of regulatory agencies. The federal government has plenty of regulators whose job it is to apply law to facts. So for example, OSHA or the EPA has plenty of obligations under statutes to look at facts and apply a legal standard to them to decide whether some activity should be forbidden or required. 
So where do they get the facts in this process? Well, another important law-finding institution, the Supreme Court, recently described necessary conditions for getting the facts in a way that we could feel uh, they were reliable, in this case, Exxon shipping, case about whether Exxon should be required to pay punitive damages in the context of a uh, shipping accident. The court um, was ch uh, asked whether admiralty law should limit the amount of punitive, punitive damages. And part of the argument in favor of limiting it was a bunch of research that had demonstrated the irrationality of punitive damages. And the court, Justice Souter, dropped this footnote in the opinion. The court is aware of a body of literature running parallel to anecdotal reports examining the predictability of punitive awards by conducting numerous mock juries where different jurors are confronted with the same hypothetical case. Because this research was funded in part by Exxon, however, we decline to rely upon it. Now think about this standard. The fact that it was funded by Exxon means that the research is not to be considered. Well, you might look at this and think that's admirable of the court to purify its gaze in this way, to refuse to consider uh, any evidence that was created, supported by an industry affected by the regulation. But you also might look at it and think it's a little bit precious in the context of what the government does. Because think about agencies that make adjudicative decisions all the time based on studies funded by the industries regulated. For example, think about the problem of environmental lead. In 1972, the EPA gave notice that it was going to think about and deal with the problem of environmental lead by setting severe restrictions on it. In 1976, it began to, refuse, uh, began to end the sale of leaded gas. 1995, that uh, leaded gas was no longer permitted to be sold in the United States. That's because, as people had concluded for a long time, lead was the mother of all industrial poisons. Now, many people ask the question, why didn't the government do this sooner? Because, of course, there was no secret that lead in the environmental context was dangerous in this sense. In 1921, the president of the National Lead Company uh, asserted lead is a poison. Even in this context of environmental context, it's a poison. Nonetheless, the petroleum industry added lead to gasoline to improve the efficiency of gasoline. 1965, the American Petroleum Institute said, all accepted medical evidence proves conclusively that lead in the environment presents no threat to public health. 1984, the story is much the same. Lead has been used in gasoline for 60 years, and there is no evidence that anyone has ever been harmed by it. Now, of course, those claims were not true, but they directly affected the EPA's decision whether uh, to decide whether or not to regulate this. Its decision thus was uh, fund, affected by uh, studies funded in part by the industry regulated. 1995, after they banned lead, um, uh, the amount of lead in children's uh, blood dropped substantially. The latest estimates are something like 80% relative to the time before they did that. And some argue that that's led to an IQ, IQ bump of two to four points. Your kids will be smarter than you just simply because they're not poisoned the way you were. But the point is, these are delays caused by studies funded in part by the industry regulated exactly the dynamic the Supreme Court was questioning in Exxon. Or think about the case of chromium-6. So there's this practice inside of companies, used to be this practice inside of companies where chromium-6 was used called the dime game, where new workers would come in and an old worker would take a dime and pass it from one side of his nose to the other, a hole that was produced by the chromium-6 in the environment where he was working. Um, this led people to believe there might be something dangerous about this particular chemical. In 1951, a study demonstrated dramatically elevated cancer rates among people who were exposed to chrom uh, chromium-6. This was, for regulators and for people studying this, a really exciting uh, fact because you had actual bodies here, not just theoretical problems that we were dealing with in the, in the, in the high abstract. Um, so in 1976, OSHA stated that it has concluded that a comprehensive occupational health standard is urgently needed, emphasis in the original, to protect employees. And they promised to complete in the shortest possible time this change. That was 1976. The regulations of chromium-6 came into effect in 2006. That's four years after a court concluded that this exceeded the bounds of reasonableness, the delay that the OSHA had led, been led into in regulating this, out, 
this uh, dangerous chemical. And throughout the delay, the single cause of the delay were these studies funded in part by these industries regulated. For one final quick case, what the problem of called popcorn lung. 2000, they discovered workers at microwave popcorn factories had this condition of popcorn lung. I'm not going to describe it in depth, in depth because it's really gross. Um, but it was called by the NIOSH the most dramatic case of cell death they'd ever seen. Yet, even though they had demonstrated clearly that this chemical in these microwave popcorn packages were causing this, there was an extraordinary delay, once again, in implementing regulations to deal with and protect workers. And there was no review permitted about whether consumers consuming this popcorn in front of microwaves heating it up were also affected by this chemical. So once again, because of studies funded in part by the industry. Now, all of these cases raise this question, whether the structure of fact-finding in this process is corrupt in the sense that I've described institutional corruption. Does it produce a process by which the effectiveness of the results are reduced, or the public trust, if there is any trust in agencies like OSHA or the EPA, is weakened? Or think about the context of journalism. There's a fantastic book that will come out in January uh, by McChesney and Nichols, The Death and Life of American Journalism. And the central hypothesis they try to push in this book is um, exactly why journalism has died. And of course, the most common account of the death of journalism looks to the internet or to this sweet man, Craig Newmark, as the reasons why the internet, why the journalism has died. And of course, they acknowledge that these are real effects caused by the internet and the rise of this super. Um, alternative to the single most profitable kind of advertising which newspapers had classified ads. But as they argue, the real decline in journalism happens long before the internet ever comes around. And they argue quite powerfully that it's in fact tied to the structure of ownership of newspapers and television stations. As they put it, the big change comes in the late 1970s and 1980s, where large corporate chains accelerated the long-term trend to gobble up daily newspapers. And the claim, this is a claim made in Senate testimony by David Simon, when locally based family-owned newspapers were consolidated into publicly owned newspaper chains, an essential trust between journalism and the community served was betrayed. So the theory is that a kind of ownership corrupts the institution. And if that's true, then this is again an example of institutional corruption. It's influence within an economy of influence that weakens the effectiveness or weakens the public trust of this institution of journalism. Now in each of these cases, all I've tried to suggest today is that these plausibly fit this form. Plausibly suggest effectiveness weakened of an institution or public trust dissolved in this institution. But what we need is something more than intuitions to make that judgment. We need a framework within which to understand or a metric to know whether, in fact, this kind of corruption has occurred. Each of us has our own ideological commitment in each of these separate debates. But what we need here is a way to escape to the extent at least we can escape that ideology. Now the project which this lecture intends to announce is a project that has this as its aim. This is the objective of what we're calling the lab inside of the Edmund J. Safra Foundation Center for Ethics. The lab is intended to become a neutral ground to build a framework within which we can know whether and when institutional corruption in these different contexts exists and more importantly, to develop remedies for institutional corruption when we can feel confident that it exists. In its initial work, we have three dimensions of project, uh, three kinds of projects that we're going to pursue. Number one is a project around data, simply to gather and to make public the data necessary to describe the influence that exists in these important institutions of public trust and to track how it's changed. Second is a project around perceptions of these institutions, to understand how these institutions and public trust of these institutions has developed or changed. And third and most difficult, of course, is 
some understanding of causation in this context. What can we say about what causes what in each of these contexts of alleged institutional corruption? And using this set of knowledge, we want to then develop remedies for the problems that we've identified. Sometimes the remedy is relatively easy. So it's my view that the remedy to the problem that Congress faces is relatively easy. Um, there's a statute right now being uh, considered, the Fair Elections Now Act, should be called the Trustworthy Government Now Act, that would essentially create a citizen-funded election process where candidates get the money to run either from the Treasury to a certain amount or from citizens and contributions of no more than $100 capped per citizen. Um, this would cost about $2 billion an election cycle, and my claim would be that this would fix the particular problem that we're identifying. It wouldn't fix the problem of Congress in general, but it would remove one kind of criticism. You couldn't plausibly say, in a world governed by this kind of fundraising, that money has bought the results. It would make it possible for you to say, to believe, as of course we all want to believe, that whatever reason Congress got, whatever idiotic mistake it got done, it was either because there were too many Republicans and Democrats, or too many Democrats and Republicans, or because they didn't pay attention to the issue, but not because of money. So I think that's a kind of easy case. But I think what we have to acknowledge is not all of the cases here are going to be easy in that sense, affordable in that sense. And think about the challenge of medicine. Seventy percent of the cost of clinical work is funded by private corporations today in the United States. There's no chance that tomorrow the government's going to spend that equivalent amount of money to buy out the private interest in that context. If there's no cheap buyout here, we still need a solution whether that's a cheap solution or not, a solution that figures out ways to draw off any problem that this process of thinking about institutional corruption has identified, grounded in facts. So that the objective of the lab here is to try to make tangible progress on a practical ethical problem over the course of, as we've said it, five years. Now some of that, so why this problem and why now? Um, some find that an obvious question, but let me work through it. Part of it, for me, was motivated by an insight that Robert Reich has advanced in his book, Super Capitalism, thinking about the way in which you're entering a period of extraordinary competition in all sorts of areas of human and economic life. So in the financial markets, in the product markets, this incredible competition that produces pressure on companies to behave in a way that's increasingly focused solely upon the underlying economic efficiency of their work. That same pressure has implications for institutions that we find central to uh, understanding and dealing with public policy, the academy, the legal profession, medicine, and Congress. And as that pressure increases, it's going to be more and more difficult for these institutions to do right, where right means a function of their institutional purpose. And what we need in this context is a set of tools that helps them respond given this increased competition. But secondly, I think, what we need is a better way to see the problem when it exists. We know, all of us should know, enough to know that we can't see it or we typically don't see it when it affects us and we see it easily when it affects someone else. So we're quick, all of us, except if there's a member of Congress here. Once I gave a talk like this and a member of Congress insisted there was no problem in Congress, but if there's no member of Congress here, then I think all of us will yield quickly to a thought that there's at least a problem to think about in Congress. But in our own discipline, it's hard for us to see the same kind of problem. Everyone acknowledges it here. Many won't acknowledge it in these other places, medicine, agency, journalism, whatever. Either because the problem is not there, or because we don't have tools sufficiently strong enough to help us see it when it is there. I think we can do something about the latter problem. And if we can, then these tools could help restore this independence that I described in the start, restore a proper dependence of these institutions, at least the institutions that we care most about, the dependence upon something like truth. Now, this year is meant to be the beginning of this project. In this year, 
we'll have a series of lectures, this is the first of them, by people who think about this problem tangentially or directly a number of areas. So within the academy in two weeks, Robert Proctor from Stanford will talk about a dynamic in history affected by exactly this problem. Within public life or private life, um, Elliot Spitzer will describe this problem and think through this issue in a lecture that won't be in this building, but um, uh, we'll tell you where it is. Within medicine, we're going to have a series of lectures. Uh, Marsha Angel, uh, David Korn, and Thomas Stossel, one after the other, will give a series of lectures addressing the question in the context of medicine, each from a distinct perspective. Within financial services, Simon Johnson from MIT will describe a dynamic of what I would call institutional corruption inside of financial services center. And there's a synthesis perspective, interestingly provided by Robert Reich, who has been thinking about this problem and is completing a book that directly addresses it, thinking about the professions as the mitigating device to deal with uh, this problem in each of these areas that I've discovered. The objective of these is to begin a conversation that will be continued next year. And today we're releasing um, a request for proposals that's calling upon asking researchers, both faculty members and postdocs that work with faculty members, to make proposals for projects to be located at the center over the next four years to help think of it as building a field that's going to link the very best in some emerging fields and some old fields like cognitive psychology, behavioral economics, sociology, about these problems tutored, of course, by a tradition of the Safra Center, you could say disciplined by that tradition of philosophy. Now, the hope in this right, is tangible progress to a practical ethical problem. Tangible meaning at the end we will have failed unless there's something we can deliver that helps people who need to work through this problem work through it better. And the need to make that hope possible is the support really of this community. 20 some years ago, Dennis launched this community on a different related project, the project of seeding a taste for the importance of ethics in the professions across professional schools and across universities around the world. He was enormously successful in that. It's a similar objective that we have here, pursued in a slightly different way, but similar in that across institutions, not just academic institutions, a recognition of this dynamic and the importance of addressing it grows. Now, I don't think we actually have 20 some years to solve this problem in certain areas of our life, but we should in the next five um, make progress enough such that people understand it as a distinct kind of problem that careful thinking can work on. So let me end by going back to this question of responsibility. So, um, just after midnight, March 24th, 1989, the ship under the command of a man named Joseph Hazelwood ran aground and spilled about 11 million gallons of oil into the Prince William Sound. This is Captain Joseph Hazelwood. Now, um, as you might have wondered as you were listening to that, a question was immediately raised about the condition of the captain um, when he was captaining the ship through this dangerous area channel. Um, the allegation was that he was drunk. He said he had only had four vodkas before he got on the ship, and he wasn't drunk. Um, uh, but the blood alcohol that was found in his blood nine hours after the event suggested that at the time he got on the ship, he must have had six times the legal limit in his blood. He fought it. His lawyers denied it. There's all sorts of questions about whether, in fact, he was drunk at the time he was captaining the ship. But what there's no doubt about is that he had a severe problem with alcohol. His mother testified 
that he knew he had a problem with alcohol in the past, and that Exxon knew it. Indeed, Exxon in 1985 treated him for his problem of alcoholism. In 1989, however, after the accident, the president of Exxon said he thought that the captain had mastered the problem. They hadn't noticed that in 1986, his driver's license had been revoked because of driving under the influence. And in 1988, his driver's license had again been revoked for driving under the influence. Indeed, at the time he was captaining the ship, he was not allowed to drive an automobile because he was, uh, had his license revoked. Now, my approach to this question of responsibility says that we should forget here this one person who obviously could do nothing about this demon that haunted him. Instead, think a little bit about those around him, the other officers, even just the sailors, the people who could have just picked up a phone in the many instances where they observed this behavior of this captain and instead just did nothing about it. We know of just one person in the history of his career here who did that, a man named Bruce Amaro, who in 1985 wrote a letter to Exxon describing the regular drinking parties the captain had on the ship. Indeed, the captain's nickname was Captain Hazelwood and his chief mate, Jack Daniels. <laughs> Only he did this. The others didn't. So what do we think about them? And I ask this question, I frame it like this, because as I think about the set of problems that we face, at least just as a nation, in the context of our government, I feel like we are they these sailors who have done nothing. We have these critical problems requiring serious attention. We have a set of institutions increasingly incapable of that attention, and that is because of us. I mean, think about this institution, the literally thousands of people at this institution focused on the most careful attention to public policy questions, trying to figure out precisely how to get the right answer to the most complex questions that we as a nation or as a world might face. And yet the relevance of that outside of the administration, which has taken half of those thousand researchers to the presidency, but the rest of the government, Congress, has no concern at all for the careful work of researchers here. That work is irrelevant when set against the suggestions of policy pushed in front of policymakers by those who fund policymakers' election. Increasingly, I feel like you know a, a passenger on a pilot on a plane watching a pilot flirting with a flight attendant during a thunderstorm, or a surgeon listening to my surgeon asking about her tee off time on the golf course, or watching half of you drive around on your cell phone while driving. Right? I look at all these problems and feel this incredible impatience of this critical problems that we are facing requiring serious attention and this fear that we are at a time fundamentally distracted. And that distraction produces, has produced already, catastrophic consequences. We have a set of institutions who have lost the ability to focus. They've lost this independence, just at a time when that independence is most critically needed. And so who is to blame in this? Who is, in this sense, responsible? It's not Blagojevich. It's a set of good people, decent people, people who simply didn't pick up a phone. It's us in this. We, the most privileged in this society, who could fix it, yet haven't. And if it's not us in this society, then who would it be? Because the most outrageous part of this story from my perspective, is that the corruptions that I'm describing here have been primed by the most privileged in our society, but permitted by the passivity of the most privileged in our society, too. I thank you, Dennis, and the committee for allowing me to launch this project here at Harvard. And I ask you to join us in this over the next five years as we try to address this problem. Thank you very much.